because of pestilences, and yet the Bible says the world refused to repent of their sins. It's all in Revelation. You know, the coming pestilences and judgments of God. Well, we need to be prepared. That's what I'm saying. We need to be prepared. Our only promised hope, our only true home and uh, promised land is in heaven. Amen. Praise God. Here on earth, we cannot put our hope in this planet because our hope is not here. Our blessed hope is in heaven. Amen. Jesus Christ in heaven. And that's our hope. Amen. We can expect that one day Jesus will take us where he is, to the Father's mansions. Amen. And where there will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. Amen. God is good. So first, Peter, uh, overcoming your personal crisis. I just want to give you a few verses that will help you. You know, get stronger in this pandemic. Whatever personal crisis you are facing right now, I can't open my Bible to, with one hand. It's so hard. Sorry about that. Okay. First Peter talks about crises, sufferings, tribulations. Amen. Because Peter knew Christians would experience some sort of sufferings. Amen. And when he, he says in chapter 1 verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more serious, much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord, open our eyes again to receive thy word, to take comfort and strength from your word. We know that we're living in difficult times and we ask the keeping power of God, our blessed hope will be revealed to us to give us encouragement. Help us to look beyond this tribulation, beyond this world. We know it's a supreme God who has a plan, who will keep us, because you have predestined us to be with you, with the Father, in all eternity. That is our promised land. That is our permanent, eternal rest in heaven. Eternal life in heaven. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. For the meantime, we are down here, stuck in this planet. Amen. Praise God. Uh, so how do we cope with our personal crisis? Well, verse 5, Peter says, who are kept, you know, even though we face many trials and tribulations, even though in the present, at present, we are grieved by many trials, verse 6. He says in verse 5, we are being kept. You who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the end times. Amen. We are being kept. You know, that's the good news. We are being kept by the power of God. In spite of our tribulations, in spite of our crisis, in spite of this pandemic and pestilences, in spite of worldwide uh, deaths, from this virus, we are being kept by the power of God. Amen. One thing we need to realize is God is involved. God is preserving. God is keeping His creation, especially the saints of God, the elect of God, the Christians, the believers, born-again believers. Amen. We are being kept by the power of God. See, if you study the Bible, God sustains the whole creation. He maintains the whole universe. Uh, otherwise, there will be collisions of the planets and the stars. And there will be a catastrophe, you know, 
catastrophe, big catastrophe. You know, it, it one large chunk of you know rock or or asteroid or whatever hits our planet. You know that that will cause a lot of tsunami, a lot of earthquake, and a lot of death. But God is keeping all of this. Amen. God is maintaining all of this. Bible tells us God feeds all the animal creation. They get their food and water from God. And, and the Bible also tells us that God supplies the needs of the saints, the believers. He supplies all our needs. The saved, the elect. Amen. He takes care of our needs. Amen. But sometimes... God allows tribulations. You know, it's been prophesied in the Bible. There will be tribulations, pestilences, wars, rumors of wars. The, the end will get worse, not better. So in spite of this, you know, plus add to that your personal crisis. You know, death in the family, you know, break, the breakdown of marriage. Um, you know, uh, teen crisis, uh, all kinds of personal tribulation, you know, here in back in the Philippines, you know, relatives who are in great need and, you know, despair uh, for money. So, yes, it can be overwhelming. Amen? But hey, in spite of all of this, verse 5, we are being kept, especially the saints. You know, Paul is talking about the believers here, not the whole world, not the animal creation, but the saints, the believers. Not unbelievers, the elect, the elect of God. Because Paul, sorry, Peter is writing to the believers, born again Christians. Amen? Amen. He addresses them in verse 3 and 4, you know. And then in verse, uh, verse 2, he calls them the elect of God, you know. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He is talking to believers. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God or the predestination of God. And then in verse 5, he says, Who are being kept by the power of God. Amen. So if you believe in Jesus Christ today, we are being kept by the power of God. This doesn't apply to unbelievers. Okay? We are the elect in verse 2. The elect of God. The elect, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God. See, the foreknowledge of God, the predestination of God, He elected us, He chose us for salvation. Right? And what does He do with those whom He elected? He saves them and He keeps them until the end. That's the context. He keeps them. First, He saves them and then He keeps them. He preserves them. For salvation until the very end. Amen. So we were born with a destiny. Amen. For salvation. And we have, we have the assurance that God will keep us in the end. God's going to finish the job. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. According to Hebrews. Amen. We are being kept by the power of God through faith. For salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. So the, God allows these trials. There is a purpose for these trials. Okay? What is the purpose? The testing of our faith. Amen. In verse 7. Peter says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, the testing of our faith. God will allow tribulation for the saints. Remember the three Hebrew children? Remember Daniel, how they were, how Daniel was cast into the lion's den? The three Hebrew children were thrown into the burning oven, the burning furnace, but God kept them alive. That's what it means to be preserved, kept by the power of God. We are under God's protection. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm not anti-vaccine. I may still get it one day if I want to go to the Philippines. If I'm desperate to see my dying relatives and, you know, our two churches there, if it's still worth, worth it to have one more mission before I die, 
I might still get it, you know, just to be able to fly. I'm not against the vaccine. But for now, last two years, I'm just under the keeping power of God. Amen. That's what I believe. I'm being I'm under the keeping power of God. Amen. God is keeping me alive <laughs> the past two years. You know, I may have come across people with virus. I don't know. Good protection. I still shop every week. I still go to the store and meet people, you know. But hey, I'm still okay. Praise God. Because I really believe I'm being kept by the power of God. See, see let, let's talk about... Uh, see, for God to keep us, He allows tribulations. Okay? He allows tribulations. Uh, and the purpose for those tribulations is it, it purifies our faith. It it's, refines us. It refines our faith, our character... So that our faith will become genuine. Look at verse 7. That the genuine is a fair faith. You know. And, and Peter makes a comparison. You know, gold is refined by fire, right? How do you refine gold? How do you purify gold? By fire. Amen? By fire. Oh. Hindi yung kambing, ha? Iba yun. <laughs> uh, when you torch the, the gold, that's a different. Uh, this is the fire that being, you know, this is the gold that is being torched by fire for the purpose of making it pure. You know, removing the impurities. Amen? And then, uh, until in the end, it's made of pure gold. So that that's what God allows, you know, He allows tribulations to purify our faith, because God wants us to have genuine faith, pure faith. Amen? And, and God allows these tribulations so that when Jesus returns the second time, verse 7, so that at the revelation of Jesus Christ, our faith will be found pure. Our faith will Bring will give glory to Him. So when Jesus comes, our faith will be ready and prepared. He will find us believing and waiting until the end. Believing. He will find us with pure and genuine faith. And that will bring glory to Him. Amen. You know, everything God does is for His glory. Remember this. That's the purpose of God. The overall purpose of God in the Bible is to glorify Himself. And, and how does He glorify Himself? By saving the elect, the people that He chose from the foundation of the world. He purifies them. He refines them, their faith, their character. And the way God does that is by trials and tribulations. It's really hard. We don't like that. You know, James says, chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into many trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, character, endurance, maturity. That the man of God, that you may lack nothing, right? You may be mature and complete. So God is, you know, purifying, chiseling us, you know. God is car carving us. <laughs> Our character, right? To conform to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who are called according to His purpose. To those who are called to be conformed to the image of His Son. God uses all things including COVID, unemployment, right? Even divorce, satanic attacks, illnesses, diseases, it, it's not bad for the faith. It's good for the faith. Amen? So I, I'm really very concerned about those doctrines that are circulating around that are heretical, you know, that Christians are not supposed to undergo trials, only blessings. Mm. You know, the prosperity doctrine, they don't talk about suffering and, and Exempted, huh? They just talk about prosperity and healing and blessing. 
Well, that, that, that's not what happened to Job. That's not what happened to, to Paul and to Jesus Christ, you know. Was crucified on the cross. You know, the, the three Hebrew children, Daniel, well, they were all persecuted. Right? That's not what happened to the twelve disciples who were all martyred to death. Uh, but hey, in the end, God is glorified because their faith gives glory to God. You know, there's a picture in heaven of the multitudes who were worshiping, who were beheaded. I believe they are the tribulation saints. They're worshiping in heaven. Those who are beheaded, they're glorifying God. Their faith is giving glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen? So there is a purpose in these sufferings. You know, don't let COVID make you feel sad, distressed, you know. Don't let the lack of money, unemployment make you feel sad, distressed. Don't let anything in your circumstances make you feel depressed, sad, and anxious. You know, I've been in the ministry 30 years, so I try not to, not to look at... Sometimes it's better to become blind, to tell honestly. Yung walang nakikita. Sometimes I think the blind, the literally blind, has more faith yeah. than those who can see. They're not distracted. Right? Because they can only think of God. <laughs> Amen? So, you know, when you... When you don't let circumstances affect you. Uh, so let's look beyond. Let's look to God. Let's look to Jesus Christ alone. Amen. 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 In this trial, you know, in this pandemic, it, it may, you know, even Jesus said, you know, these are the beginning of sorrows. It's not going to get better. Mm -hmm. It's been prophesied. Jesus prophesied all this. The love of many will grow cold. People will become loveless. Yeah. There will be intense persecution. But hey, in spite of this, God is keeping us. That's, that's what matters. That's the only thing that matters to me. God is keeping us. And the elect, okay, I'm not talking about the world. The elect. Look at verse 2. The elect, according to the foreknowledge of God. And when the Bible uses the word elect, it's talking about the saved. Mm -hmm. The regenerate, the born again believers. Amen? Mm -hmm. The true children of God. We are being kept because from the day we were saved, God is keeping us. Don't you realize that from the day we were born into His kingdom? Up to this very moment, God is keeping us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Same with, your, with the newborn child, you know, from the day you, you see your child in the nursery, in the hospital, you take it home and you take care of it until the end. Yeah. My kids are still my dependents. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I, I still support them. Amen. Free rent, free grocery. <laughs> free food. <laughs> Uh, and I'm my oldest one, 25 years old. I'm going. I'm going to pay his butcher course. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. He's going to take butchering. <laughs> Five grand. Mura pang That's cheap for about three or four months. Then he can butcher cows. Their own cows. Yeah, he, he can be a professional butcher, right? Because his wife is in the cattle business. So he's a tradesman now. He's, I still support him. Oh, I said I'm going to pay for that. Amen. Because I love them. They're my kids. They're irreplaceable. Right? And so, this is how God treats us. You know, from the day we became born again, right until the end. Amen. No matter what happens, God will be with us. Amen. He's going to stick with us even in your deathbed. Amen? Praise God. So God is good. He's keeping us. So when bad things happen, remember these trials and tribulations is testing our character, our faith. Uh, we need to have strong faith so that when Jesus returns, we are we will give glory to Him. He will find us perfect and true, not fake. 
not backsliders, not lukewarm, but you know, with a perfect faith. Amen. You know, only perfect and genuine faith will give, look at verse 7, will give praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus returns again, only faith that is perfect and genuine will give him glory, praise, and honor. And God is making sure that when he returns, he will find you with perfect faith. With perfect, genuine faith. God is making sure that will happen. How does God accomplish that? Well, God can allow trials and tribulations. And at the same time, keep you. Right? That's all there is, you know. Do you think you can perfect your faith? We all don't want to go to church sometimes. We all want to abandon the Bible sometimes. We're all, we all have our low points sometimes. We all have a tendency to become lukewarm sometimes. And so the perfection of our faith does not depend on what we do. Amen? It depends on what God does. If God stops His work, He's keeping work, He's preserving work, you know, the, in, in the Bible, in theology, this is called the perseverance of the saints, you know. When God keeps the saints, the saints will persevere, right? The secret of our perseverance is the keeping power of God. If God stops His work, we all die in the faith. Because we will not be able to overcome all these trials that are happening yes. on our own. So God is always working in strengthening our faith. Amen? Praise God. He, and then he uses the trials like fire, you know, like a torch. Your faith is like gold that is being torched by fire. So don't be angry when bad things happen. Sanay na tayo, hindi po ba? I know, I know we should really stop looking for perfection because only heaven is perfect. Yes. Amen. I don't look for a perfect wife. No. Misa nga, banasa banasa tayo sa sawa natin, di po ba? Nangyayari po yan, di po ba? Isang palitan. But hey, you know, there's no perfect wife. <laughs> There's no perfect husband. Yeah. You're stuck for with each other for until death do us part. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> What's the secret of survival in the marriage? Well, it's the keeping power of God too. Amen. Amen. It's the keeping of God. Amen. If God doesn't keep your marriage, baka yeah. matagal na kayong wala. That's right. God is also keeping our families together, you know. Amen. God is keeping the church. It is true. He is preserving the church. Amen. Uh, but again, the church is not also perfect. Let's remember that. Amen. Praise God. We will always be rocked by scandals uh, in the church. Amen. Okay, anyway, that's a complicated topic to discuss right now. But it's good to know that God is keeping us. Amen. So I believe we will survive. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors. We will survive, survive famine, tribulation, sword, hunger. Amen. Remember, remember Romans 8? Paul talks about the believers being more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 We can conquer many things, you know. Let's go to that verse. Amen. Romans 8. You have to believe this because Christians will face this. Amen. In this world, we will face this. Amen. 
But Romans 8 tells us, verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things, nor present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. The love of God keeps us. The power of God keeps us. Nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. No death, neither angels, principalities, powers, Satan cannot separate you from Christ. You know, nothing. Amen. In verse 35, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Verse 35, Romans 8. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword. Nothing. None of these things shall separate us from the love of God. See, God may allow distress. God may allow Famine, God may allow nakedness, God may allow the sword, but in the end, nothing can separate you from His love, from His keeping power. Amen. Amen. Uh, I really believe God can keep me from cancer, God can keep me from dying from this virus, but when my time comes, when God allows death, then that's it. That's the exception, right? Yes. That means it's your homecoming. Amen. Amen. I believe God will only keep us right until our appointed time, mm -hmm. our allotted time. Mm -hmm. Say He granted you 90 years, mm -hmm. 80 years, 70 years. Well, He will keep you until mm -hmm. that long. But also there's an exception to that. In 1 Corinthians 11, some of the saints died early. Because of sin. Yeah. That's an exception too. Right? When God allows discipline of death. You know, there is a sin that can lead to premature death. Don't you know that? It's in the Bible. Yeah. There is a type of sin that will lead to premature death. And in 1 Corinthians 11, it's unfortunate that some believers have died early. Uh, we need to be careful. We don't cross the line. Amen? Amen, amen, yes. We need to fear God and, and hate sin. That's what the Bible tells us. Fear God, hate sin. Amen? In 1 Corinthians 11, let me read it to you. This is not my sermon today. Tell me honestly, I feel that the Holy Spirit is leading me here. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, let a man examine himself. In his in the faith. You know, before you, Romans, sorry, 1 Corinthians 11 is about communion, okay, partaking in the communion, okay? Let a man examine himself. Then let him eat of that bread, the communion, and drink of that cup, verse 28, 11, 28. Before you partake of the communion table, Examine your heart first. Okay? Because if you don't, verse 29, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, verse 30, many are weak, talking about Christians here, okay? Many are weak, sick among you and many sleep. The word sleep means dead. Many died. Many are weak. Many are sick. Because when they partake of the communion table in an unworthy manner, verse 9, 29, if you partake, he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself because he does not discern the Lord's body. So, bago po tayo mag-communion, kung meron tayong kasalanan, hindi pa tayo nagre-repent, huwag tayong basta-basta 
When I just said in English, before we partake of the communion, examine your heart. If you know there is sin in your heart and you're not repenting about it, don't partake of the communion table. It is better not to partake. Because if you partake in an unworthy manner, if you partake, if you eat the bread in an unworthy manner, that means there is sin in your heart and you're not repenting, you are drinking judgment. You are drinking judgment to yourself. Judgment. The judgment of God, the discipline of God. For this reason many, verse 20, 30, for this reason many are weak, seek among you, and many die. Remember, the communion table is not a ritual. Okay? Now I know, I'm, I'm talking about the communion table here, in the body of Christ. The communion of the elect, not the communion of the religious, okay? Yeah. The communion of the elect, the, the, the body of Christ. When we participate in our communion table here, make sure you are you examine your heart and you repent. Because if not, you can get sick. Instead of he being healed, you can get sick. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, maybe some will say, "Bakit mga religious araw na communion di masila ng mga matay?" But they're not the body of Christ. They're not saved. Right? But when it comes to the born again believers, the saved, the real body of Christ, that's the real Jesus. I mean, that's the real bread and cup. The, the real bread and, and blood. You, you don't desecrate that, right? You would rather go to a religious church and participate in... in in a religious, you know, communion, than, than to go to a real body, the true body of Christ, you cannot do that. Amen? Otherwise, we will all get sick. Because Jesus is here, this is His body, He redeemed this with His blood, we're all born again, right? We know what repentance is, that the Bible commands us to repent, you know what you should be doing, you know what the right thing that you need to do? If you break your conscience, if you're committing adultery and partake of the communion, when you know it is wrong, yeah, Christians still sin. Born again people still sin. Right? Mm -hmm. They can still sin. We're not in heaven yet. We can still lie. We can still cheat. Right? Repent, but repent. Uh, you know that that famous apologist Ravi Zacharias, man, he stumbled. Yeah. A multi-million dollar ministry, a big name. But you know, other apo Christian apologists are beginning to doubt his true salvation. They're beginning to doubt it now, because a real, genuine born again will fear God and hate sin. Yeah. Right? You're a new creation, right? That's what it means to be a new creator, to be regenerated with a brand new heart. Yeah. You're not the same. Yeah. And so when you live like a sinner, like the world, then it, everyone, everyone begins to question you. Are you really regenerate? Are you really born again? Are you saved? Are, did you really get saved? So everything becomes questionable. So what I'm trying to say here is if you know you are a born again Christian, speaking in tongues, you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit, that's why you became born again. You know what sin is all about. You're, you've been washed by the blood and you cross the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't repent and you go to church and do communion. Not not the Catholic communion, the real communion, the, the real Lord's table, then you are drinking judgment to yourself. Yeah. Right? But what are you bulag na nagko communion? Right? But what are you doing with the people who are going to be able to do this ritual? 
mo maawa pa just doon dahil bulag sila eh. Pero yung nakakakita na, tapos you will cross the line, hey, don't do that. That's a different category. Yes, yes. Okay? You get the point? Yes, amen. That's why sometimes in the body of Christ, some are sick. Some are dying early. I don't want that to happen to me. When I had cancer in 2009, I really fasted for five months and asked God, what have I done? Am I paying for my sin? Or you, need, you need to check that. You never know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What have I done? Am I dying? And I survived. Maybe God forgave me. <laughs> Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Never too late, right? Amen. Amen. For God to forgive. Amen. 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 So, yeah. So, that's the exception. Sometimes God allows premature death. But assuming everything is okay, you're, you're a faithful Christian, amen, you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're praying, you're reading your Bible, you, you're serving God, you're worshiping God, you're fellowshipping with the saints, that's the commandment, you, you need to assemble with, with the church, right? You need to be in church, that, you know, that, that's in Hebrews, do not neglect the fellowship of the saints. You're doing what you're supposed to do. Then you can be sure that God is keeping you no matter what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen? When you know your heart is clean, mm -hmm. when, well, you have that assurance that God will keep you. Amen. Amen. The only exception is two. Number one, when it's your appointed time. I already explained that. Yeah. When it's your, for Paul, 80, 70, he had to sacrifice his own head like this. That's the appointed time. Nothing you can do about that. Amen? The second exception is when God allows death and illness and sickness as a form of discipline. Because there is no repentance. Right? That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, you know, the sinning immoral brother in 1 Corinthians... Let's go read that. You want to hear what Paul said about that brother? A born again believer who's acting more in a manner that not even the world is committing. Sometimes Christians can commit sins that are more horrific than the sins of the world. It can happen, right? Because we're still humans. Yes. First Corinthians chapter 5. These are the exceptions of God's keeping power, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's read that. 10 minutes. Ten minutes? Wow, I have a 10 minute warning here. 1 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, it is actually reported, verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality is not even named among the world, the Gentiles. That a man has his father's wife. My God, it's a soap opera, hindi mo mawapanood to eh. Hindi po ba? But in the actual church, it is happening. <laughs> Amen. It's a very horrific drama. That a man has his father's wife. Oh, his, ste his stepmother, right? There's sexual immorality between a man and his father's wife. Uh, his stepmother, I believe this is a stepmother. Yeah. And you are puffed up, see? There's sexual immorality among you in verse 1 and verse 2. You are proud of this. You are puffed up. You have not done anything about this. You have not mourned. You have not, you know, taken away. You have not... You have not done this deed that he, that the deed of oh, sorry I lost that he who has done this thing might be taken away from you. In other words, you have not done any discipline to remove this person from among you, from among you or this fellowship or excommunicate because nobody's agreeing with him, right? You are proud as a church. Then Paul said, 
I, absent in the body but present in the spirit, have already judged. And this is what he recommends in verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together next time in a church service, along with my spirit, I'm, I'm with you in this even though I, I am absent. Paul says, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, if you look at Paul, the apostle, it, it would seem like, well, oh, Paul, you're not very loving, Paul. Why would you say to a Christian brother, deliver such one to Satan? Well, that's not very lo loving, you know, for an apostle to do that. Well, we're talking about discipline here, brother. A sinning brother who refuses to repent. Okay, and the most loving thing you can do is to make sure he gets saved and he, he repents one day. Yeah. Right? And this brother is not going to repent. If you tolerate him, there's nothing yeah. will happen. If you eat with him, if you accept, if you fellowship with him, if you treat him like a regular brother, nothing's going to change. This brother is not going to repent. What you need to do is excommunicate this brother. Okay? In the name of the Lord Jesus, deliver such one to Satan. That's very hard. In other words, give him over, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You know, Satan will give you AIDS. Mm -hmm. Satan can give you AIDS. Satan. Satan can give you an illness. Uh, a thorn in the flesh. You know, Paul said, I have a thorn in the flesh from Satan, right? That's a form of satanic attack. Uh, so deliver such one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Well, why would Paul say deliver this brother to Satan? Well, you know what, what's happening here? What's, what Paul is simply saying here is just, just let nature take its course. He is already in the hands of Satan. Satan is already in control of him. Satan has already possessed him. Satan has already used him. Satan has already seduced him to commit the most unimaginable sex opera story in the whole world, you know. That a man is, you know, copulating with his grandmother. Well, that's not very nice. That's not glorifying to God. He is already... An Possessed by the devil. So Paul is a savior. There's nothing we can do. Just let nature take his course. Let Satan eat him up. So he will repent. Let him do what he wants to do. After all, there's nothing we can do. He has opened the door of his heart for Satan. He has allowed Satan to, tor to possess him, to torment. There's nothing we can do about this. Just, let, just give him time and see what the devil will do. Maybe one day he will repent. Right? Amen. Maybe one day he will realize like the prodigal son, you know, I've been feasted on by devils and demons. Mm -hmm. This thing should not have happened to me, but look where I am right now. Yeah. I'm, in very, uh, I'm in a very bad situation. And then he remembered his father's house. He remembered. Hallelujah. That's what Satan sometimes. Sometimes God will allow Satan to torment you so that you will remember the Father's house. Right? He remember, in my Father's house, none of these things happen to me. This is abnormal. In my Father's house, I was safe and secure. I had a normal life until, see, he rebelled. And then he came back to his senses. He remembered his father's house. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people who are desperate because Satan has destroyed their lives, 
they will remember. They will come back to their senses and remember that in their father's house, they were pampered, protected, provided for. And you lost all that protection because of rebellion, because of sin. This is what is happening here. Paul is saying, just let Satan eat him up. Mm -hmm. Right? Deliver him. In other words, uh, just give him over. There's nothing we can do. Just like when your doctor tells your wife he's dying of cancer, there's nothing we can do. Cancer has consumed him. Sure. It has spread from head to toe. There's nothing we can do. So Paul is saying here, let's just let the, let the devil do what he has to do. And hopefully, maybe one day, he will come to his senses and repent. So that in the day of visitation, he will be saved. That's what Paul said, right? So that in the day of visitation, he will be saved. So Paul is still hoping one day, this brother will repent. But it's tough love. It's tough love. Right? Because really, accommodating a brother, pampering a brother, treating a brother normally is not going to bring repentance. No. Sometimes you need tough love. Okay? Sometimes it's what's needed to bring to repentance. So, these are the exceptions when God does not protect. Mm -hmm. Amen? That's so why at the end I can conclude with all things work together for good. Sometimes our own sin brings us to repentance. Our own sin brings us to sobriety. Our own sin brings us to normal life again. Right? Sometimes we have to sin before we repent. And of course, all things work together for good. Amen? I think David's sin of adultery made him a better person. In the end, right? He, when he wrote Psalms 51, he was, he wrote a prayer when he when he confessed his sin of adultery, right? Psalms 51, the prayer that he prayed to God for forgiveness when he committed the sin of adultery. Psalms 51, one whole chapter about the prayer of salvation for the sin of adultery. And we know in the end they became a much better person. Amen. So, yeah, that's my sermon today. And you know, whatever we are going through in life right now, we just know God has a good purpose for it. Amen? Amen? Whatever trial, tribulation you are facing right now, God has a good purpose for it. And let's just hope that in the end, we will see that the handiwork of God, God's purpose in the end. So this COVID, let's just hope 2024, 23, 25 will be better years. <laughs> let's hope for the best. Amen? But you can never tell, you know, the Antichrist might be just around the corner in three or four years. But, you know, to tell you honestly, the best life is not here. It's up there. The best life is in heaven. Amen? Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are keeping us. That you are keeping us. But there are times when you chastise us, when we don't repent, when we, when we don't deal with our sin, when we take the Christian life for granted, when we compromise, when we act like the world, when we bring our sin to church, when the world is in church then God sometimes chastises His own children. He disciplines us. He rebukes us as a father does to his own child. But all of these things are done for the purpose of restoration, for the purpose of love, that we might be saved in the end, that we might repent of our sins in the end. And so Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, in spite of all the tribulations we are seeing around us, we just entrust our lives into your hands. 
We want to examine our hearts and make sure we have repented. We, we are not harboring sin in our hearts. We want to make sure we have no bitterness, we have no anger, we have no uh, hatred, indifference um, in our hearts. We want to make sure we are doing what we're supposed to do. We're not lying, we're not cheating, we're not stealing. And we walk in integrity. Because in these difficult times, we can be taken down any single day. We can go down with the virus. And so Lord, I pray, keep us with your keeping power. Your, our job is to make sure we are walking in obedience and your job is to make sure we are kept safe and protected. And so I pray for the whole church. I know you are chastising us, you are pruning us, you are perfecting us, you are making us genuine. You have allowed us to go through the fire, through the fire, so that in the end our faith will become genuine for the praise, honor, and glory when Jesus returns again. God will be glorified. It will be a happy, blessed reunion. So Lord, this is our prayer. We will not allow our present circumstances to, to weaken us or to cause us to give up or to cause us to, to commit suicide as some people in the world does. We will not lose our hope. We will always fix our eyes on Jesus. Thank you. You will keep us. You will provide for all our needs. You will heal our bodies. You will protect us from virus, from unemployment. And if it does happen, you will provide miraculously. And Lord, we commit the church to you. You will take care of this church until the very end. The only thing that matters to God is the salvation of the elect. The elect is saved and kept until the end. God does not guarantee that life will be perfect. That the church will be perfect. But he guarantees that the elect will be kept and protected and saved until the end. That's the guarantee. So God, you will keep this church until the end. And I, I know you will flourish this church again, Lord, in a matter of time. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Send these people now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for coming to church today. God bless you.